Hello and welcome to the Brooklyn Rail. Uh, I'm Malva Kajali and I have the pleasure and privilege of being your MC today for a very special conversation on the Black Art Library in Detroit. Here with us today is the library's founder and curator, Asma Walton, joining us live from Detroit, who will be in conversation with curator Alexis Assam and art writer and editor Jasmine Weber. We're also thrilled to have the poet Charisma Price with us here today, who will read to close today's program. So really excited for that. Uh, I also think it's important to note that we started this series, Common Ground, back in August, which feels like so long ago, uh, looking forward to the election and with the goal of mobilizing our daily actions to radically reimagine our democracy. So it feels deeply uh, appropriate and meaningful to me that we're convening again here today on this heavy week with uh, heavy but, but hopeful week with a project that deeply embodies exactly that, uh, the Black Art Library, and tuning in from the city of Detroit, which has carried much of the heavy lifting of the Michigan results uh, that came in yesterday. So really looking forward to this talk. To begin, I ask you to join me in acknowledging the Wappinger, Canarsie, Munsee, and Lenin Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and the Shinnecock Indian Nation the traditional owners of Lenapa Hopking, the unceded land and waters on which we stand. Finally, the Brooklyn Rail would like to honor the lives of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Tony McDade, Nina Pop, David McAtee, James Skurlock, Jamel Floyd, Ahmed Arbery, Richard Brooks, Rhea Milton, Dominique Remy Fells, Toyin Salau, Walter Wallace Jr. and countless others that we have lost to white supremacy and police violence in this country. And we would also like to acknowledge that justice will come from the streets, from the nation demanding accountability and refusing to move on until Black Lives Matter in the eyes of the state. Before I introduce our illustrious guests of this afternoon, we invite you to join us for a brief moment of silence. Thank you. Uh, and now to introduce our fabulous guests. Alexis Assam is an emerging curator with a dual focus on contemporary art and arts of the African diaspora. She was the 2018-2019 Romare Bearden Graduate Museum Fellow at the St. Louis Art Museum, where she co-curated the 2019-2020 exhibition, The Shape of Abstractions, selection from the Ali Collection, which presented the work of five generations of Black artists who have revolutionized abstract art since the 1940s. She currently works for the Philadelphia Museum of Art in her second year as the Constance E. Clayton Curatorial Fellow, where she is hard at work on a number of current and upcoming exhibitions. Jasmine Weber is a writer, editor, and visual artist focused on Black art histories and visual culture. As Hyperallergics News Editor, she reports on the challenging power dynamics of art workers in the arts sector and recent efforts to carve out a more equitable future for the creative industries and beyond. Uh, and the fabulous Asma Walton is a Detroit native and founder of the Black Art Library, the focus of our conversation, uh, which is an ongoing collection of books on Black visual culture, which will become a public facing archive and research library. Uh, which she intends to be an educational resource for the Black community and beyond. Black Art Library started off earlier this year and her beautiful daily images spotlighting covers of the books in her collection, from art books to children's books to so much more, quickly made the library extremely popular on Instagram. She's currently fundraising to expand its collection and acquire a brick and mortar space in Detroit. Uh, and until then it will be on view at the Museum of Contemporary Art Detroit in early 2021, which is right around the corner. Asma holds a master's degree in arts politics from the Department of Art and Public Policy at NYU and a BFA in arts education from Michigan State. And she was previously the inaugural KeyBank Fellow at the Toledo Museum of Art, as well as the 2019-2020 Romare Bearden Graduate Fellow at the St. Louis Art Museum. So without further ado, uh, Alexis and Jasmine, passing the mic over to you. Well, I just wanted to start by saying thank you uh, for inviting us to be a part of this talk. And Ozma, maybe we could start by you telling us a bit about um, the Black Art Library, what it is and why you started it. 
So the Black Art Library is something I started very early February of this year. And I kind of just started it because I knew I wanted to start something. I didn't really know what I wanted to start, but I knew I wanted to create some sort of research resource. Um, and Black art is pretty much like one of the things that is weaved throughout my life. Um, is something that's super important to me. So it just made sense to create a, a resource that I would be able to use to educate people on Black art. So when it started, it kind of was just the Instagram account. Um, and I would just buy books, take pictures of them when I bought them, and kind of just share, share with people like what this journey of collecting was looking like for me. Um, a lot of people started to follow the account and then also because of COVID, everyone was indoors. So they were looking for kind of different ways to engage on the internet, looking for different accounts they could follow, different ways that they could kind of get involved with the arts and just things in general. And a lot of art teachers started to follow the page. Um, a lot of, you know, parents with small children, but also curators and just people from kind of all different areas um, in the arts. And I just continued to, to buy and I continued to share. And eventually I decided, I was like, well, let's see if anyone wants to like donate any books to me. I'm just gonna throw out this Amazon wish list, and we'll see if I get any books. Um, and for me, that was just a really easy way to I could, you know, share my address without actually sharing my address with people because the books were coming to where I was living at the time. So I was like, okay, I don't want to just post my address, but this way they know exactly what I'm looking for, and they can send it directly to me. And I started to actually get books, and I was really surprised. And I was getting books from people that I didn't know. So like complete strangers, like they would write their names. I was like, wow, I have no idea who that is. But they just donated a book and I would try to like see if they were following the account because I wanted to be able to, you know, follow up and personally like thank all the people that were donating books. But some of people didn't even really leave their names. Um, so it wow. was just a really cool experience just to see that people were supporting this thing that I didn't really even know what it was yet. Um, at the time when I first started, I was kind of wrestling with an idea on how I could do it without having a physical space. Um, I don't know if anyone has ever used Chegg, but I used Chegg in undergrad and it was a way to like rent textbooks. Mm -hmm. So you would get the book, you would keep it for however long the semester was, you mail it back to them. So I was thinking like, well, maybe that kind of like structure might work for the Black Art Library. But as I kept thinking about it, I was like, uh, I don't know if that would really work. Like, what if they don't send the book back? Because I know everyone doesn't send their textbooks back. <laughs> so I was just thinking, I was like, um, okay, like maybe. And I was just kind of thinking through, through more of the ideas. And eventually I was like, well, a physical space would be really great for this. And it just might have to look a little different than a traditional library. Um, my goal is for it to be a non-lending library. So essentially, um, it would just be like a reading room, but it is a space that people can come in and spend as much time as they would like um, with the books and just enjoying them. So that's kind of where the idea kind of evolved. Um, and really it's been such, I feel like it's been such a short time. So, sorry, my cat is like, geez. yep. But um, I feel like the time has gone by really quickly, but not that much time has gone by. So this idea has really like evolved over the past few months. And it has been very like exciting to, to kind of just watch it grow. I think that um, the fact that you started it so soon before the U.S. started its first lockdown is also really interesting to me because of how digital the project is for the time being. Um, so I'm curious what it was like growing it while all of these efforts for mutual aid were sprouting up on different corners of the internet and people were really considering how the arts can survive. Um, 
so many people um, were losing their jobs because um, of the pandemic. And I think that a lot of people started to think through ways that artists and other creatives and art workers could carve out spaces for themselves, um, especially for things like black art, which is already historically pushed to the margins in art spaces. So I'm curious how the pandemic also shaped the, pro the project in a way. So it was, it's really interesting, like when I'm thinking back to, I like launched the library like on February 1st. So thinking about maybe like what, three or four weeks after that, like things had completely shifted um, with everything. And I just kind of used, first I kind of used my time inside. I was like, well, I have time because I was working from home um, during that time. So I was like, well, I have more time to kind of search online for used books. So I was spending a lot of time on looking on used bookstore websites. Um, I was, you know, ordering a lot of them because some of those sites were super amazing because I could get maybe like 15 children's books for like 60 bucks. And I felt like, I was like, okay, this is great. Let me keep doing this. But we did start to notice that packages, like it was a lot more difficult to get your packages. So I was getting things shipped to me. Um, most of the times they were large boxes. So once at probably a few times um, early on, things got lost. Um, I received one of my boxes of packages and there was nothing inside the box. The box was completely empty. Like I went to go like get it from the package room and it was just like an empty box that they had kind of like taped back together. And I was like, well, I don't really, I was like, I don't really know what to do about this. Like, do I say I didn't, what happened to the books? Like, and did they not know that it was empty when they delivered it to me? So that was kind of one challenge. So I was really nervous to kind of keep ordering books because I didn't want things to keep getting lost in the mail. Um, and then also as the, the year progressed, there were a lot more things happening. Um, a lot of the protests and a lot of organizations were looking for support. Um, Black-led organizations um, were fundraising for different kind of goals. And this is where I felt like I got another little like boost in my following because people were looking for ways that they could support Black organizations. And people that, you know, are involved in the arts or that love the arts, they were like, well, this is a, this is a great one for, for me to support because it's something that I'm super interested in. Um, one woman, she was like, well, I love books. So this was perfect. And she sent me like a bunch of the children's books on my list because she was also a mom with like two young children. And she was like, this has been kind of great for me. And the same with a lot of the like young kind of starting out art teachers. They're like, well, now I know what other books I can get for my classroom collection to kind of diversify the artists that I'm teaching my students about. So there were a lot of people looking for ways that they could support something. And I think this project kind of checked some boxes for people that were really. I think she'll be back in just a moment. In the meantime, I was wondering actually Jasmine, I feel like I've been really curious to ask, um, I've been really curious sort of about your relationship to like his historically black owned bookstores and like that space is kind of a counter, a counter example. Yeah, so um, we've, we've talked a little bit about this, um, just that, so when Asma reached out just to let me know that she was interested in um, having me join this conversation, I was really excited because the Black Art Library's mission of um, distributing um, information about Black literature, Black art books, was really personally interesting to me um, because I, um, I actually spent a lot of time in Black-owned bookstores as a child um, because my dad, um, before Amazon closed so many bookstores, was um, a bookstore owner. Um, oh, she's back, so. <laughs> well, Jasmine, I think you, you can continue with that story. Okay, um, yeah, so um, Black literature was always something that I was um, surrounded by. 
I spent a lot of time in the bookstore with children's books. Um, I was super um, active as a reader. And I think that having such easy access to black literature in particular was really important for me just because so much of the young adult um, fiction that was being pushed, even when I went to my library, when it would talk about like new releases and things like that, were always by white authors about white protagonists and things like that. So for me, I think that the service that you provide Asma is really vital just for people to even learn about these books, especially with things like the children's books, because they're really hard to find. They're not um, as readily available to people as they, they should be. Um, and especially um, with the closure of so many black bookstores because my dads were definitely not the only ones in our area. Um, they started off in Queens where there were a ton and now they're really impossible to find. I think in Manhattan, there's one um, called Sisters Uptown. Um, and I think there are maybe one or two others in the Bronx, just thinking about generally like the five boroughs, Long Island area where I, um, I grew up on Long Island. Um, but yeah, I think that having the service be digital will really improve the reach of these sorts of things. Um, because even going to a standard library, it's almost impossible to find black literature, let alone black art books because the art sections are so minuscule. And this is an issue that's not solely found within you know, typical bookstores or libraries. This is also um, an issue that, um, as we talked about a bit last week, is an issue in universities and in museums as well. So many times in my research, I've definitely had to um, ask my libraries to order books specifically for my research, to buy them for the collection, because it was something that I really thought was valuable. Um, so many of the books that I use for my research, I have to get through interlibrary loan because so many institutions don't have a strong focus on um, Black and African diasporic um, books in their collection. Um, and that also is often reflective of the collections themselves. So it's an all intertwined issue. Asma, can you hear us now? Yes, I am back. Great. Wonderful. <laughs> Welcome back. Thanks. Um, and one thing that I'm interested in, um, I know that you were in and out for parts of that conversation, but one thing I'm interested in that you do with the Black Art Library is treating these covers as art objects. The way that they're presented on your Instagram feed makes it really legible for people who need those visual cues that the cover can provide to figure out what's of interest to them. I mean, there's like an unfathomable amount of books in the world and no human could ever read all of them. Even if you're only focusing on black art, you just can't get through all of them. And so that legibility of being able to see, is this about painting? Is this about a woman artist? Things like that are really important, um, especially for young readers, but for any reader. Um, and so I'm curious to hear about that decision um, to make it sortable by those images. So for me, like personally, reading is kind of difficult for me because I have sort of a short attention span. So visual things, like I'm all for everything visual. Um, so being able to actually like look at those covers in a way that they kind of do stand out as their own kind of piece of art, like, you know, in front of like this white background. Um, I think one, the covers are already beautiful, but it makes them even more like visually appealing just to look at them and just to see them. And I think posting just the covers allows you to see just the cover and kind of just focus in on that and kind of, you know, take what information you can from the cover. But then I think that's when your interest is also peaked. You see something, the cover might not have anything to do with it, but part of you is intrigued enough to at least like open it and you might read at least one sentence open you know open it up to the first page you see look at one picture but either way the cover got you to you know see more of that book than you would have otherwise you might have just like walked past it if you weren't able to see that cover um so I think it's super important to you know showcase those really beautiful covers on those books, especially with all these books being art centered, they all have really amazing covers and that's intentional. So I definitely like making sure that they're seen. 
Another thing that I've been really enjoying, you know, talking to you about this project, scrolling through the Instagram, is just like the diversity of the kind of materials that you have available and that you're collecting. So you have children's books, you have journals, you have really scholarly art um, catalogs um, and art books. Um, so there really is something for everyone. So since you put up that first Amazon wish list, um, how have you kind of navigated all of these donations that you've been getting and kind of keeping them to your um, your goal of what you're collecting? And can you detail exactly what it is that you are collecting in the terms of Black art? So when I say Black art, I'm specifically talking about visual art. So I'm talking about painting. I'm talking about photography. I'm talking about sculpture. Um, and that can also be different types of weaving and basket making and kind of furniture can fit into those categories as well. Um, it is super important to make that distinction because there are a lot of different forms of art, including dance, including music. Um, and I'm intentionally leaving those out, even though they're all kind of connected and they all have, you know, grow off of each other's histories it would just widen, I think, my scope a little bit too much. Um, I want to keep the scope for the project as narrow as possible with what I'm collecting because I want people to be able to find exactly what they're looking for. If you're coming to the Black Art Library, you have a specific artist in mind. Um, say you are just super interested in finding whatever you can on Gordon Parks. Um, I feel like that the scope is narrow enough to where you can easily probably find some Gordon Parks in the library, but I felt like if I started opening it up too much, I would just, it would just be not as easy for me. Not saying that in the future, when I do have my own space, there might be like, oh, this is the wing for performing arts. Um, and then I can start collecting that as well. But I think just to start out, I'm trying to be super intentional on what I'm collecting and keeping up with the donate. I think that it's something that I've recently kind of realized could be an issue is making sure that people actually know what the scope is of what I'm collecting because some people have their own kind of like idea of what what black art is which is totally acceptable and it's more so on me to make sure that it's clear so they understand exactly what I'm looking for because I really hate when I get books and they don't really fit into the library at all. So now I'm just like, well, now I don't know what to do with these books. In my mind, I'm, of course, never get rid of a book, but I just have to repurpose the books, figure out where I can give them. Like if there's an individual person that would more so benefit from having it, um, I try to do that as well, but I'm like, okay, it would be a lot easier if I didn't get the those in the first place, because then I wouldn't have to worry about finding a new home for them. Um, so, I haven't had too many issues with that until recently and not even a lot. Just maybe I've gotten maybe like five or six books over the year that I'm just like, this doesn't fit into what I'm collecting at all. Other than that, I get some really great things. Um, I get a really, I have one donor. Um, he's sent me like two large boxes of books and he sends me the greatest books a lot of really old catalogs from the Studio Museum in Harlem oh that goodness. you can't really find anywhere. And if you go on like Amazon Marketplace, it's like $673 or something like, you're like, okay, well, I can't actually buy that. But I get some really amazing things. And it's just so, it's so nice that someone is like trusting you with these books that have probably been in their personal collections for years. Um, but I understand that sometimes you do want to get rid of books, but you're scared about where they're going to go when you get rid of them. So I think being able to find somewhere to donate them and you know, like, okay, they'll have a better home there than they will with me. So I think that makes it a lot easier giving up like these really amazing books because definitely I will take great care of them and more people will be able to enjoy them. If it's just sitting on one person's shelf, how many people actually get to engage with that book and open it and just see it? Not many people at all. So if it goes into something that is for the public, I think that makes people feel good to donate and to kind of share the things that they've collected um, over the years. 
I think what's really interesting too is that so many of the books that um, are in your collection are most likely out of print. Um, like books from the 90s that if you don't have them and you don't care for them, they could end up, if um, somebody donates them, could end up in a landfill, could end up in a library that doesn't know how to sort them properly and so they don't ever get read ever again. In your library, they really take on a new life and new possibility to re-enter this sort of canon of Black art um, to make them rediscoverable, so. Yeah, and that that's such a great point. I've noticed a lot with the children's books that I order, because I usually make sure if I'm getting a children's book, I'm trying to find a hardcover or a library binding. Um, just because the soft covers, like, it'll just get bent so easily. And I'm like, I'm trying to hold on to them as long as possible. But a lot of the books that I order from used bookstores are out of like books from libraries that they've gotten rid of. So I'm just like, well, what did they do with all the ones that they didn't send to this used bookstore? Like, did they just go in the trash? Like, what, how are they getting rid of the, these books? Just because I'm thinking, I was like, well, I don't really remember a time at the public library near me when they were just giving the books away. So they have to go somewhere. And then I guess if they, maybe they sell them, I don't really know what they do with them, but it's, it's just really interesting to think about, like, even when the book goes to the library, that's not the last place that it's going to go. It might stay there for 10 or 20 or however many years, and then it's going to go somewhere else. And it's really nice that some of them actually make it to me. Um, and I really love when I open it, it has the like old, like the, the little card in it from the library with the little stamps on it. I have a few that like still have the cards in it and I try to keep everything in the books that comes with them because you never know. Um, I got one book and it had a cutout from a newspaper article from maybe 2010. And it was about black, like four black women artists. So it was talked about Ammonia Lewis, um, and there were a few more women that I can't remember who it was, but someone had just put that in that book, probably because they cut it out and like, well, this makes sense because it was a book about Black artists. It's like, well, it makes sense if I keep this in here. And I was able to get that article. So, you know, that's going into the collection, like something, things that I keep. Um, I found really nice, like notes <laughs> and quotes, like inside the books on sticky notes. Um, and it's just really nice to kind of see all of the really amazing things that you find that have been living in these books over the years or that the owners had maybe forgot was even inside of the book because they hadn't looked in it in so long. But it's just been really nice just acquiring slowly all of those books and being able to spend time really looking through them. So, Asma, related to that, as you're growing your collection, I'm wondering, you know, how are you cataloging these? And I know that your um, background is in art education, but did you ever take the library and archives course? Like, are you learning all of this along the way as the project grows? So yes, I am learning all of this um, as I go. I think when I started the project, it really was something that, you know, like this will be a little side, something fun that I'll be doing. I never really intended on, okay, this is something that I'll more, more than likely be working on like full time that I have to put a lot of work into. Um, so I've been kind of figuring it out as I go a few months back, I think maybe right when I moved back to Detroit um, in August, I knew that I had to catalog all the books I had collected so far. So I moved from St. Louis to Detroit and I had a nice amount of books. I think I had maybe at least a hundred books that I've acquired since February in the collection. And I was like, well, I need to catalog them before the number gets out of control. And then I have to spend like two days, like just sitting at a computer typing into an Excel sheet. So I had made the Excel sheet and I was kind of just staring at it. And I was like, okay, so I need to start typing all this in. I need to go find the ISBN number. I need to add everything in there. And then I was like, wait, there has to be an app that can do this. I was like, why am I even like, there's an app for this. So I just went to look at the app store and I found, um, I actually think it's just called like books. Like when you just look at the, look at it on your phone, it just says books, but it allows me to either scan the back of the book. Cause you know, sometimes they have the barcodes on the back that has the ISBN number. 
So I can either take my phone and just kind of scan that back, or I can just, I'll have to manually type in the ISBN number, which is something I have to do a lot because a lot of these books are older and they don't have the little barcode on the back. But I'm pretty sure that has cut down like 75% of the time it would have taken me um, through that process. And it, I was really excited that, that, was, that I was able to find that. And I was like, okay, that kind of can increase productivity in my cataloging, but now I'm at the point where I'm like, okay, I think I've probably acquired about another 200 books that I haven't cataloged yet. So now I have to go back and do that fairly soon. Um, so what you're yeah. saying is you have about 300 right now. I think I am close. I think I'm right approaching 300. Um, when I did the pop-up, I had maybe about 240 and that was in August. Actually, it was in September. Um, so I had about a little less than 250. And I know I've bought a nice chunk of books since then. I've gotten a few like boxes of donations since then as well. My goal is I'm trying to get to 500 books by the end of the year. I think it's totally doable, but it's just more about me sitting down and <laughs> looking through all the books that I should get, especially when you don't really know what books are out there. It's just like I have to find them and like, oh, yeah, this is something that I could use. So it's it's a process. So sometimes it takes it takes a while, but it's it's always fun to do. So <clears throat> I also think that um, the fact that you're in Detroit, which is a sitter, city with such rich black history, I'm curious how that affects the way that you run the organization and and Obviously, the fact that you're interested in opening a brick and mortar space in the city um, is a big consideration. So how is Detroit part of the Black Art Library? So when I was thinking about this project, it pretty much always, if there was going to be a space for it, it was going to be, you know, where I consider home, which is Detroit. And of course, like Detroit's like rich, rich history, like within the arts is very relevant, but it was more so like, this is where home is for me. And it just so happens that home is also where all of these really great and amazing things have happened um, within the history of arts performing and, and otherwise. Um, so I knew that this was a place that something like this should exist. Um, Detroit is currently the blackest city in the US. So it makes sense that the Black Art Library would be here, that we at least have some type of archive here of something like that. We do have the Motown Museum here and they're about to start doing some work on that. They got some funding, so they're gonna be expanding that, which is super exciting. But I was like, well, more than one kind of piece of history can exist. And I think the Black Art Library will be something that's really great for history um, to come. And I'm really excited for Detroit um, to be the center of where it's going to be. And I really want it to not just be a resource for, for scholars and academics. I want students that go to Detroit public schools to be able to, to use this library, for them to be able to come here and know that this is a resource for them even if they don't want to do anything art related and they just want to, they like studying at the Black Art Library because it's quiet, even to that extent. But I want to open up these type of resources and I want the arts to start being, you know, a little more centered. Um, most people only think of art as if one, you've had exposure to it when you're young, you have to study art in order to know anything about it. People have a lot of preconceived notions about being interested in the arts and you don't need any of that. You really can just walk up to a painting and say like, oh, that has red in it. I really like red, like that can be it. It doesn't have to be anything more than that. So I want to be able to use the Black Art Library to help people understand that as well. So they are a little more comfortable in other arts institutions um, just because museums and galleries can be very intimidating, um, but I want the Black Art Library to be a space that feels comfortable, that can feel kind of like home, that could just feel like somewhere you can just go. And I want that to be kind of a tool to start 
you know, breaking down those fears of entering those other spaces. Even if you don't have to want to be an artist or a curator, you might actually just really want to be a D1 athlete, but you might like to look at painting sometimes. And I want you to know that that's okay to do. Um, so really this space is not just for students, but everyone in the community. So they can kind of all have that same understanding that art is for everyone. Everybody can enjoy it. Um, and everybody can learn something from it. There might be one artist that you just learn their name and that could be what you gain from the Black Art Library. And that would make me happy. If you learn one thing when you leave the space or just looking at the Instagram, I'm happy. That's beautiful. So Anya, as we continue to look to the future of the Black Arts Library of the physical brick and mortar space, um, I wonder, if you could tell us a little bit about the fundraising aspect, because we know you've been receiving um, donations of books, but you've also been raising throughout the project uh, for you to purchase a brick and mortar space. Yes, so around July, um, I actually was invited to be on another like Zoom kind of panel conversation with a few other Black women that are working in the arts. And that was kind of the first time I was really kind of publicly talking about the project. And one of the women that was on there um, is actually the founder of the Free Black Women's Library. So one, I was really excited to be able to hear about kind of her work with that project, kind of, cause she is five years into that project now. So I'm like, well, I'm in a completely different space. So it'd be nice to kind of hear a little bit about what she's done and how she's done that over these few years. And after having that conversation with those women, I felt very like, like, okay, I felt like motivated and inspired to like do something else. So I was thinking like, what else can I be doing for this project? And I just really started to think about the fact that people are really interested in this project. They want to support it and they want to, you know, help me in any way that I can, that they can. So I was like, well, maybe I'll just start fundraising and we'll see what happens. I was like, at the very least, I, you know, I don't get any money. It's not like I lose anything by starting a fundraiser. So I decided to start a fundraiser that would kind of help me with cost of books, because if I'm not getting donations, I'm buying books out of pocket. So I was like, well, you know, if I can raise maybe like $1,500, that can just go towards like a little fund that I use to buy books. I up, you know, uploaded the fundraiser maybe within like a day or so. I was almost at that amount. And I was like, oh, maybe I should raise like my fundraising amount. So I was like, okay, 3,500. I was like, I'm just gonna raise 3,500 and we'll see what happens. And, you know, the same thing, I started to raise the money really quickly, like within the next day. So I was kind of getting encouraged, like, you know, you could think a little bigger. There's like more that you could, you could ask for, you can ask for more money and you can do more um, for this project. So I was like, okay, well, maybe I'm not just fundraising for the books that I'm trying to buy. Maybe I'm also fundraising so I can put a little money away towards a physical space um, when that time comes and whatever other kind of fees kind of come up with me working, um, doing the Black Art Library, just because this is pretty much my full-time job right now. Um, so this is what I'm working on. So it's like, well, you know, it would be nice to have a little like extra money to help me like work through this project as I'm spending most of my time doing it. So within maybe a month, I had raised about maybe within three weeks, I had raised about $5,000. And I was like, okay, wow. So I just decided to, to keep it up. And I raised the amount to, I just raised it to $30,000. And I was like, if I don't raise $30,000, that's fine. It's not like I lose all the money if I don't get to that, you know, that $30,000 marker. Um, but it was just a way that I was like, well, I'm just going to keep this up. And I can always, you know, use an extra five or $10 for another book. So I was letting people know that, okay, I'm going to actually keep this up, um, making sure that I'm keeping everyone in the loop about what I'm doing with with the funds like that's super important your donors need to know exactly what's being done with the money that you're collecting from them um so right now i'm you know saving some of it for physical space but i've continued to kind of buy books 
Um, and that's really like what I'm using the money for now. And the GoFundMe is still up um, on the Instagram account. And the goal is to just, you know, let's just keep it going. I think I'm very close to having a total of 10,000 raised since I started the fundraiser in July. I actually think I may be like less than a hundred dollars away. I don't know. I'm I'm close. I don't look at it too often because I'm like at, at first I was just looking at it like every hour and now I just like occasionally like look at it. Um, but that's super exciting for me to have raised like ten thousand dollars in a couple months because I was that was never like something that I thought I could actually do for this project. But it really did show me that there are people that are willing to kind of like invest in an idea like this that could be really meaningful to the community so it just I'm like okay well now I just have to I try to talk about the project wherever I can try to have as many like zoom meetings with as many people as I can even if I don't really know how they could help me with the project it's just nice to be able to meet people in different circles because a lot of me meeting other people has been through like, well, I met this person on this Zoom call or they saw me on this call and they reached out to this person that they know that works at this gallery and they have a bunch of books that they can mail you. So that's a lot of what's been happen happening. So I've been, you know, making a lot of really wonderful connections. And I do think the kind of digital world that we've been living in for the past like few months has made that a lot more possible. It's it's not weird now to just get on a Zoom call with someone that you've never met ever before in life. Like it's really common. Like I've met several people through Zoom um, over the past few months and it's not weird anymore. It's just becoming a new way that we're kind of socializing with each other. And I've been able to kind of thrive um, with the Black Art Library during this time. I think one thing about um, the Black Art Library that really stands out to me is the fact that you seem like you put accessibility as your first and foremost goal. Um, and the three of us have talked a little bit about this before, but so many art libraries are attached to museums where you can't access them unless you're buying a ticket or have a membership to the museum. Um, and this returns a little bit back to what you were saying about you want anyone, not only art students or curators to be able to access the library and learn something about art. Um, and so accessibility being something that's so central to what the Black Art Library does um, seems really important. And I'm curious to hear, was this something that you were thinking through when you started this back in February? Were you really just collecting um, to see where it went? Um, and like, how has the pandemic's um, highlighting of this lack of access in the arts um, because of um, so many different things that are going on in terms of loss of funds um, with these museum organizations begging for funds, begging the government for funds. You're doing this and you're raising $10,000 on your own. And I think that that's amazing. <laughs> so thank you. Yeah. Um, so thinking about accessibility, I think that was always kind of a top priority for this project and really the reason that I was creating it. Um, so I studied um, art education in undergrad and that's what my BFA is in from Michigan State. And while I was in that program, I my eyes were kind of open to the lack of accessibility that really exists in art education. Even just for me personally, um, I was one of the only, actually, I think I maybe was, my cohort was pretty small, maybe about 14 or 15 of us. And I think I was the only student that didn't have art throughout school. I also was the only black student in my cohort. Um, so, and I was the only one from Detroit. So there were a lot of different, I was the only ones like in that, in that group. And a lot of them were saying that, well, I wanna be an art teacher because I had this really amazing art teacher in school. And I was thinking, I was like, well, that's not really why I wanna be an art teacher because I didn't really have that experience. I kind of wanted to be able to be an art teacher to someone that didn't have one. So I think I was always kind of looking at the program from 
an accessibility kind of standpoint. And I knew that I wanted to do something a little different with art education, but I didn't really know what that looked like. I was being pushed towards like a very traditional kind of path of art education. Get your degree, you do your, you know, you do your teaching internship for a year. So you have to teach one year unpaid, which is a whole nother kind of like issue that I had um, with the program. And I was just thinking, I was like, well, I feel like there's another way that I could be an art teacher. There's another way that I can, but I didn't know what it was. And all of my my teachers and my advisors are like, you should just get the teaching certificate because you could just use it and it'll be useful. But I was like, but that's one year of working for free. And I also have to take classes for a master's in education. And I don't really want to do that. So I eventually I was just like, I'm just going to listen to myself because I know what I'm talking about. So I decided not to pursue a teaching, um, a teaching certificate, which seemed like a good idea for me. I just decided to go straight and to get my master's. And I, I knew I had an interest kind of in museums because they were a different way that you could kind of get people to look at art, to kind of give people access to the art. And I eventually started working at the Toledo Museum of Art, which is a museum that was founded on the principle of arts education, which was super huge to me because of my background but they really put our education first in everything that they do. And I thought that was super important. And I thought, well, this is a, a really good way for me to be able to engage people in different communities, being in museums. But I knew, I think I always knew that there was something else that I could do, um, but I didn't really know what that looked like until I kind of came up with the idea. So now like with this project, I'm able to merge kind of all of those things, art education, kind of working in museums, um, black art, I'm kind of able to merge everything that I really love about the arts into, into kind of one area. And like my worlds are like colliding and it's really cool and <laughs> really exciting to see. And it's just been a, a really great kind of process to kind of see how that works and kind of see what is up next for the Black Art Library, which is something that I, had no idea when I started this project in February that the next year I would have an opportunity to exhibit the project at the Museum of Contemporary Art Detroit. So, you know, full circle kind of like moment looking at where I was when I first started and had no clear idea of what <laughs> this was going to be. I knew it was going to be something, I just didn't know what that something was going to look like. And to where I am now, where I'm still continuing to, you know, show this project a little more and find more people that are interested and kind of get it out there any way that I can, which is a really huge goal for me until I have a physical space. I want to try to show this project anywhere that I can. I want people to know what it is before there's ever a physical space for it, because I don't want it to just pop up and people in the surrounding area are like, well, what's that? Like, what's that thing right there? I want to already be engaged with the people that live in that area to the people that, you know, live in, you know, the outskirts of wherever the library will be. But I just want people to have an idea of what the project is. So that's really what these next, I don't know, few months, years, I don't know how long it's going to take me to get a physical space. But every, you know, every extra minute and month and day that I have, I'm going to just use it to try to get more exposure and shine more light um, on this project, just so more people can really you know, see see what's going on and be along for the ride because I feel like this is really just the beginning. It's amazing. <laughs> that was beautiful, Asma. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so we're at one fifty. I didn't know what time we we're gonna do questions. We have, we have, say, about 10 minutes, if there's any, uh, any other threads you three would like to pick up. Well, well I, I kind of had a question for both of you guys. Okay. So either of you can answer it first in kind of, you know, whatever way that it comes out. And I kind of told you guys I would pose this question, but I'm just really curious to know 
how the Black Art Library would have been useful to you in your career so far. So, you know, becoming a curator, becoming an art writer, um, looking at specific subject matter, doing all the research that you've had to done, had to do even, you know, just in undergrad or maybe even in high school, just if this existed, how would you have been able to use this? I mean, let's even just start with the conversation of high school. I mean, I took an AP art history course in high school. And that was a wonderful course with a wonderful teacher who I still, probably one of the greatest teachers I've ever had. But the curriculum and the way you're taught for the AP art history exam is very Western. Um, you know, even if you have a teacher that has the best of efforts, you know, they're really teaching you something that's outside of the test. Um, and so having access to the Black Arts Library would have given me so much more knowledge about um, you know, what Black people have been creating throughout history um, and to be able to delve into that for my own. Spent so much time in um, undergrad, uh, you know, focused on things like Impressionism uh, because I wasn't really taught about what are, what are the stories of Black people within the arts. It just wasn't uh, highlighted. So that would have been invaluable to me. I would have I feel similarly. Um, I mean, it wasn't until I was in college that I even really was aware of um, Black uh, visual art in the sense of like um, an institutional um, presence. Like I always had art in my home, um, like so many of like the stereotypical black like prints that you see in like your grandma's house like I always grew up around that and I knew that there were black artists making really awesome work but it wasn't until I got to college that I realized um the history of exclusion of black artists in institutions um really my first visit to the studio museum was when I started researching and I really opened my eyes and I think that having the black art library to sort of guide me through that um, research process would have been really important for me. Or if I had seen it in high school, I think it would have saved me a lot of like shock and awe thinking that like I took art classes all throughout high school. Um, I really built my schedule around it, but I never knew that I could make art about my identity. I always thought that they had to be very separate. Um, I uh, I loved like abstract expressionism and I don't think I ever realized like how personal and political art could be even though now I realize like the history of abstract expressionism is really political but that wasn't taught to me in my classes. Um, it was I, they weren't art history classes so it was a lot more just about like the formal aspects of the work but I think that the Black Art Library would have really helped um, cultivate my curiosity about the underpinnings of these movements. And then also just when I was doing my um, senior thesis in undergrad, it was so hard finding books that were relevant. Um, it was so hard to go to the visual arts library and find the stuff that I needed to find. I mean, I was searching up keywords like in their digital search system. I was trying to find things on the shelves. Um, but basically my thesis like focused on the 70s, the 90s and like the 2010s in terms of black art and looking at the covers of some of the stuff in the, in the black art library would have helped me pick out like, oh, that's from the 70s. Maybe I should see if I can find a copy of that. Oh, that's from the 90s. So I think there's so many things that the Black Art Library could have helped me with, honestly. So I'm just glad it's here now for, for so many people to utilize. Same, because I definitely feel kind of, I mean, the same way because I was, you know, learning art education. So when you do art ed, you have to take every art class, you have to take some art history, you have to take a little bit of everything. And I took a contemporary art history class and I don't really think I learned about any black artists that I can think back to when I had a really, you know, there was so many, I feel like opportunities for 
them to teach some of it or some of that information, but it just never, never happened. I felt like I learned a lot more about ancient like Greek art and in, in those like very beginning like art history courses that you have to take. And I was like, well, I feel like there was a lot that was left out and there aren't any African-American art courses that are specifically tailored to that, like at Michigan State. I think Michigan State does have an African art course, um, but those are also separate. They're related, but separate. Um, so I think a lot of the information just isn't out there in a way that professors and teachers know how to utilize it in a way that can best benefit their students. Um, because now all the information is there, but how do you know what they need to know? It's kind of just like, you don't know what you don't know. Um, so we haven't been learning this kind of throughout history. So who are the key artists that you need to highlight for this specific style of art that are black artists? We might not know because no people are doing that research now and doing that work now. And there are professors that study those areas now, which means 50 years from now, we'll be in a lot better shape than we are now, but it's still the right now that we have to kind of kind of work through. So we're kind of just stuck doing our own kind of research and learning on our own. So that's really what I'm trying to do with the library. I'm kind of trying to do a lot of that work for other people. So it's already there, like, okay, I've created this, this collection of books and you can just go directly and look at those books. Like, pretty much everything that you could hope to look for is probably in there. So I just want people to be able to have an easier time kind of getting this knowledge. Yeah, that's great. I mean, even if I look, if I think back to, I took a course in undergrad that was American Art Centennial to Modern. In terms of Black artists, I learned about Jacob Lawrence and I learned about Romare Reardon and that was the end. And there's so many more Black artists Black American artists in that period that I learned about working in museums because they might have had a work in their collection that I learned about because I looked in a book about um, modern Black art, modern contemporary art, that I learned more. And it's a lot more of what I learned on the job than what I ever learned in school and had access to in, in the libraries near me. So, I mean, this is going to be so wonderful when it, you know, is open to the world. And even now, um, through the Instagram, people just becoming more aware of what is out there and what exists. Definitely. There are just so many books that you really don't even know. Like, even me, like, when I find books, like, oh, I didn't know that book existed. But, like, now I have it. Even books that have been donated to me, like, oh, I've never seen this book in my life, but it looks wonderful, and I'm really excited to have it. So it's always, I'm always learning and learning about new artists, too, which is another really exciting thing about working on this project is that I'm always learning. Thank you all so much. Um, not to put you on the spot, but I have a last question I, I would love to ask. Um, so, and this is for all three of you, uh, but I feel like we've been talking a lot about um, like the phenomenon of like, a lot of what we've been talking about is wanting to expose people to the resources and the artists and the shows and the works that are like, going to be really formative and meaningful and inspiring to them that they might not have been able to experience otherwise. And we've been like touching on some examples. So like the studio museum, like, you know, following the thread in a book, in a this, in a that, like ordering the books. But I was wondering if um, you guys could just like, I I'm wondering who you see as your artistic predecessors, curatorial predecessors, like who are those people that you guys discovered like either early or late um, or currently, like, what are these books that are like doing it for you? And that are like key to your formation, you know, like key to your, like all the brilliant work you're doing at the Philadelphia Museum for hyperallergic, like as an artist, as a curator. So I, I don't know if this counts because it's a book that I haven't read yet, but it's on my list and I have it. So it's like in my possession, but I just haven't cracked it open yet. Um, but you know, I've read a little bit around it. I've kind of heard other people kind of tell me about it and I know that I need to read it because it's going to be important, but, um, Kimberly Drew's, um, recent book. So I think it's everything I know about art. So that's one that is on my list just because I really love that everything that she has been doing over the past few years 
and how she's been able to kind of carve out kind of her own space kind of in the arts, but also being able to center Black art and Black people in a lot of what she does. Um, so pretty much everything that she does is super exciting to me. Um, so that that's one book that's it's it's on my list. I'm just gonna say that one's on my list, and I know it's a good good read. Um, I'll definitely say that um, the first time I became familiar with Kelly Jones was when I read South of Pico. Um, I think my senior year of undergrad. Um, and when I found out about her and her career, I think that really was. A, a breakthrough for me in the sense of like what I want to do because I think she writes so beautifully about art and her um, books and, and her other writings are so well researched that I it really inspired me to want to do that art historical research about these communities and about these artists who have been overlooked um, yeah yeah, and similarly on that vein, I feel like when I was doing my uh, research over a year ago for my show that just closed at the St. Louis Art Museum, The Shape of Abstraction, I was reading a lot uh, of catalogs uh, by Thelma Golden for the Studio Museum and kind of looking to how was she writing about some of these artists who were also in my show and always gaining inspiration from all these Black curators who came before me who are still you know, doing all of this amazing work and research and writing. So there isn't something in particular um, that I can point to, but um, there are so many curators that I look up to and read their work constantly to kind of inform my own as well. Thank you all so much. Yeah, Thelma Golden is a powerhouse like onto her own. Uh, and I feel like that's like a very powerful place to transition to Q&A. Uh, so thank you all for your beautiful thoughts. Uh, our first question will come from our very own friend, Lynn Crawford. And Lynn, you can turn on your microphone now. Hi, thank you so much for this amazing uh, presentation. Can you hear me? Yep. yep. Um, Asma, I was wondering, you, you grew up in Detroit. Are there particular spaces or artists in Detroit that, um, that inspired you and that continue to resonate with you? So interesting enough, um, my, my mom works at the Detroit Institute of Art and she has since I was about four. Um, so I was always in the museum, always surrounded by art, even when you know I was kind of oblivious to everything that was around me and really, I wasn't super interested in art as a kid. Um, but I was kind of, I was always around it. She would, you know, bring home like posters after exhibitions closed and have different art kind of catalogs lying around. So every, all of that was always there. Um, and it actually took me kind of some time to really find out that that was something that I was interested in. My, when I graduated high school, I went to school for culinary because that I wanted to be a chef from like age 10. So that's, I knew that's where I was going to be. I was not interested in the arts at all. Um, but I think growing up kind of in the DIA, but also just around parents that, you know, appreciate the art. I think that has definitely kind of shaped a lot of what I'm doing now. Um, so I really can't even think of specific like art spaces, I guess kind of like home <laughs> and being, you know, in my mom's office. Um, are kind of things that kind of shaped my interest into art, just kind of looking at things in that kind of visu visual way. Thank you. Amazing, thank you so much. Uh, our next question will come from our very own friend, Lake Kopnik, who will also be on tomorrow's new social environment. Uh, so that's always fun. And Lake, you can turn on your microphone now. There we go. Well, thanks everyone. This has been just fabulous. I'm so excited that people are talking about libraries because I think they're just the most amazing spaces I could ever imagine. I got to spend a year kind of in the bowels of the New York Public Library and it was one of the greatest <laughs> years of my life. And the, you know, they're just these amazing spaces and everything that you were saying like rings so true to me about how 
libraries are a place where you just accumulate stuff and then you you take it out of the market and you bring it to one place and you preserve it and you're a steward for it and then you make it available to people. And that's such an amazing kind of revolutionary model when it was first posed. And originally museums were, were really used exactly the same model and they were often in the same building. And I just wonder, you know, those of you who are curators, can you imagine that model coming back a little bit more? I mean, museums are so exhibition centered now and so spectacle centered that they've really lost that notion that you just accumulate a huge pile of stuff and let people see it. I mean, you know, in the 30s and 40s museums, if you look at old museum catalogs or exhibition uh, catalogs, the amount of stuff, the range of stuff they were collecting, including by black artists was amazing, much more than we collect now, I think. And I think we've lost that notion that museums just make stuff available so that people can do good stuff with it. You know, and I'm just wondering, especially from the curators, if you could imagine that model coming back a little bit more. Well, first, I, I want to say that definitely like what you said is super like it rings true, but also it just makes me think about how a lot of museums, they do have their own libraries and that they have really amazing things in their libraries. And most visitors don't even know that those exist. Um, they don't know that all those books are up there. They don't know that they can go to print study rooms and see works of art up close. They don't know that they can do any of that, which of course I think that's on purpose, like because they don't want, well, they're like, well, they don't want everybody wanting to go to the library. They don't want like whole families taking all their kids up to the art library to look at all the books. It's just the way things have kind of been along the years and it's kind of, Yes, that resource is there, but only if you know that it's there. It's not like something that's really like broadcasted, but I think it should be. And I think those libraries are super amazing like spaces. And I think everyone should be able to take some time if they're in the museum already, you know, they can just stop by the library really quick to see something. If they were able to kind of just check books out regularly or whatever like easier system could exist for visitors to actually be able to look at some of those books. I definitely think there's a market to kind of create that and make that a real possibility because I think that would be super beneficial. I think um, what's really a shame about the fact that so many of these um, museum libraries are treated in this very ivory tower way where people don't really know that they can access them or don't know how to access them is really the fact that like, yes, books are precious, but I think sometimes they're treated as overly precious where they lose their intent, which is to be read and which is to be, uh, which is to teach people things. And I think that if we make it so difficult for people to access them, um, they lose interest and they don't want to learn. Um, so I think that that's, Blake, your question is great just because, um, I think that sometimes museums do focus on spectacle rather than the purpose of teaching, so. Or letting people learn. I mean, the thing about yeah. libraries is yeah. no one says, you will now read this book and think the following about it. You will read the following 12 books and here's the take home message. It's not how they work, you know, 99% <laughs> of the time. And museums, I mean, museums used to actually be more accessible and they were founded, even a museum like the Met, was founded in theory for the average New Yorker. Rich people had owned the art. They didn't need to go to museums, right? But, and that really, I mean, most museums at one point or another had no admission fee. And all of that seems to have changed. And a lot of those libraries used to be open to just about anyone who wanted them. It really does seem to have narrowed rather than widened, you know? Yeah. I think price is often really prohibitive in a variety of ways because people, they go to a museum to see something very specific and they might not even be thinking about just even the larger collection that they could experience maybe they're going for this special exhibition so to even go just to kind of go and hang out in the library and read more isn't even on their radar because they're like oh well, i'm going for i have an hour and i'm going to go do this one thing and then i'm going to leave which is really unfortunate as you know as what i'm saying agreed for sure Thank you so much for that question, uh, Blake. Um, I really love where this conversation is going because it's so lovely to think about like libraries as the ultimate democratic space. And, you know, I feel like in the last year or two, we've really begun to see how 
the library is also like, you know, one of the only like properly socialist spaces that exists or continues to exist. Like where else can you occupy space for free? Um, which is obviously not, not so true of these libraries, but uh, this is all to say, I feel so invigorated by this conversation of like libraries and how do we decolonize like these elite institutions and maybe they go hand in hand. Uh, so thank you for that brilliant question and responses. Um, next, we're going to go to a sort of compilation of audience questions that we got, uh, which will be read by yours truly. Um, and this is sort of, uh, a lot of people are wondering, Asma, if you could talk a little more about the responses you've had to the Black Art Library. So I know personally that you had the socially distanced pop-up a while ago, and I was wondering um, if there are any experiences or anecdotes that you can share, uh, you know, of what people came in and what they found and what conversations this has been starting for you. So the, the pop-up was a really, really great um, experience. I knew I wanted to kind of do something like in person that actually allowed people to see the books in person to like touch the books um, just so it wasn't this like far out concept and only, you know, existed in the virtual space. So I got really lucky during the, I think it was towards the end of September, we had another really nice like 80, 90 degree weather day um, that weekend and the pop-up was indoor and outdoor. So people were allowed to kind of come into the space, see the books, kind of have a chance to look through them, find a spot that they wanted to read, like go outside if they brought a blanket or a chair, just sit in the back um, and, you know, spend some time with that book reading. So I got to see a lot of people just you know, one in nature, just kind of sitting and enjoying themselves, but also reading some of these really fantastic books. I also had a puzzle set up back there and it was an Alma Thomas puzzle and it was also a really hard puzzle. So we did not make any progress with that at all, unfortunately, but it was really nice to see people still kind of in the space, spending time. I had um, one visitor, he kind of came up to me and he, he wanted to talk a little bit and he was saying that, I think he he was an artist, but more so a musician, um, so not super familiar with visual arts. And he told me that he had only known about Basquiat as far as like black artists go. He was like, that's really the only one that I knew. Um, but earlier I had seen him kind of sitting down reading one of the books, like he was sitting down for like a long time, like kind of comfortable. And he was telling me about the book that he found and. I don't even remember what one he was reading, but it was talking about how some black artists went to, you know, went to Paris after World War One, World War Two, to just kind of spend some time there and escape kind of the daily kind of pressures that they were facing as black artists in the United States. They were able to kind of go there and have a little more freedom. And he was saying that I never knew that was a thing that happened, which is a very common thing that has happened um, throughout history um, and black art history, but people don't really know about it. And he was just really excited that he had a chance to like read something about it. And that was one moment that was super, super kind of like meaningful for me because I understood that I always say that like Basquiat is one of the, you know, that's one of the main artists that people know because his work is super, even now, like super commercial um, and how they're, you know, doing everything and putting everything out for it. So it's kind of hard not to know who he is at all. But I was like, there's so many other artists um, that people could really learn about. So it was just really great to see that there were young people. Um, so teenagers, younger than teenagers that spent some time looking at some books kind of laid out on a blanket with their friends um, reading some of the books. So it was just really nice to see everyone really kind of engage with the space. Um, I had a little response kind of wall. It was more so it was just a window that you put a sticky note on, but I was trying to get people's opinions on their time with the library, what artists they were able to learn about just to get a little more information about that. And I got some really meaningful responses that were just really exciting to see. So all, all, all in all, this just made me really excited for what's next and to have a physical physical space because I was just thinking like what if it was you know like this every day um and people could really every day come to this this library spend some time with this one book even if 
two people only came in that day, but you never know. Somebody could spend three hours like reading through a whole book um, in one day. So I was just really excited to actually be able to visualize what it might look like. I love that. Um, I also love uh, Charlotte Lowry in the chat is pointing out uh, a text that I think we should all read, The Library Book by Susan Orlean. We've just dropped a link. Uh, which apparently is uh, a good model for museums having radically accessible libraries and like what that looks like. Uh, so I'm very excited about that. She just, Lynn Crawford just said libraries as community spaces, um, which I think transitions nicely, like thinking of like discovery of art and history as being kind of like liberational as well. Um, and like can be really good for self-discovery. Uh, our next question comes from our very own social media manager, uh, JC. And JC, the mic is yours. Thanks, Malika. Um, thank you all for this conversation. Um, Asma, I really, I love what you said about being able to have like all of your worlds and interests collide in this like project that you have. Um, and I, I remember the New York public advocate, Jumani Williams, expressed kind of a similar thing with the protest that happened last summer. Um, where he was always an advocate, uh, an activist and a politician, but finally he was able to be both at the exact same time. And I think that there's, um, okay, sorry, these two things connect. There, so there's this like, there's this amazing amount of grassroots efforts right now, I think that I'm seeing to realize in very small ways, the world that we wanna see. And I think this connects to what you said about the, the collision in that um, the new world world knowledge has like full and complicated interdisciplinary like creatures. And so I guess I want to know how you think about the possibility of institutionalizing what you built. I know you're, you're showing the library at, um, at a museum early next year. And, and are you thinking about how you're going to navigate the process of like, kind of like solidifying into a, a more like cohesive codified capital T thing? Um, how you're going to preserve the like multifaceted, very fluid nature of the library um, as it stands now? So I've not, I don't have an answer <laughs> for that question yet, just because I think everything is always, you know, it's always moving and it's always changing um, kind of with this project. So I'm really kind of now navigating like moving into a space where I'm doing something with MOCAD, which is, you know, something completely different from the pop-up that I did um, just at a, a space in Highland Park, Michigan um, at it, it's a house that is going to be used as a space for artists, but they're really two co completely different things. Um, but I do know that I want to continue on being able to let the library exist in these different types of spaces. Um, so being able to exist in strictly kind of community based spaces, but also in larger institutions as well, um, just because I know like with larger institutions, there are sometimes certain issues that come into play, or you know, when you're attaching to a large institution, you might not completely agree with some of their ideals, which I think is an issue when kind of moving into really large institutions. Um, but in my mind, this is just a way to disseminate the information about the Black Art Library a little more. Um, it's a way to get more eyes on it. So I think it's really important to be able to let this project exist in as many different types of spaces as possible. So community centers, schools, um, maybe a bakery, maybe a hair salon, maybe there's a pop-up at different, type of, different types of spaces in different communities. And I just think it's important to make sure you're not cutting out any possibilities for who could benefit from the project. You said you didn't have an answer. That was an amazing answer. <laughs> well, it, it came to me as, as, <laughs> as I was answering the question. Okay, thank you so much. You're welcome. Uh, our next question will be a little bit of a, a sharp left turn uh, and will come from N. Paul. Uh, and you should be able to turn on your microphone now. Okay, hello everyone. Um, yes. Uh, so uh, my experience, I think about my experience growing up and accessing libraries and really my whole reading agenda was basically how to connect with women. Whenever I saw women reading, 
I was interested because the guys never liked to read in New York City. I would see them on the subway listening to music. But something struck me when I learned that The Three Musketeers was written by a black man. And this is in my late 30s, which is crazy to me because if, had I known about these type of authors back then, it would have changed my whole trajectory in terms of what I would have pursued. But it went even deeper as I'm, I'm learning about art and, and spending a lot of time in different libraries throughout the world. Um, we don't consider um, patent holders as artists, Black patent holders in particular, because what I'm noticing, like if you look in the UK, they're starting a whole revision of their educational system. And as I was looking at their itinerary, nothing was talked about financial economics for Black people. So I'm actually writing a lesson plan to look at Black patent holders globally because they are artists, so they have to design these instruments to create the traffic light, et cetera. So are you planning on including that type of context in, in the library? So I think that was a really great point to bring up. Just, I think one, it goes into speaking about how broad um, the term artist can right. be and how much can actually really fit into what an artist is. Um, because I definitely think inventors um, are, are artists within their own right. They're, they're creators. Um, and I also think they, they think more with the creative side of their brains as well. Um, but for, for what I'm doing that I wouldn't include that, but I think that those are super important kind of people to highlight, especially in kind of the history museums that we have um, in some of those type of spaces like black kind of history museums uh, in Detroit, we have one of them. Um, but I think those are a lot of the things that do need to be highlighted and are super important to just kind of be integrated in what we're learning in a daily basis, even from, you know, from young, from elementary school, you do start to learn, you know, Black History Month, they teach you about a few like inventors that you hear about for the next years that you're in school, the same ones over and over again. But I think there is a very like wide range of those important people that are kind of working within their own field that can still be considered creatives um, and still to be considered artists. So I do agree with you that they're artists, but just for what I'm doing with the Black Art Library, um, that wouldn't be included just because, um, like I said earlier, I'm trying to just keep that scope super, super narrow. And just even that subject matter alone would open up so many more kind of avenues and possibilities um, just considering all of the, the Black patent owners that are in those conversations. Okay, thank you. I, I will also say, I think one really interesting aspect of your comment is just that um, this idea of world building as art um, has, I think, been, been um, even more at the forefront of the conversation because of the digital aspects of world building. I have a friend, Keenan Smith, who writes a lot about it in terms of... Um, the video game civilization. So I think that thinking about these patent holders who have created these um, created these objects and inventions um, and also just folklore like stories that have become really ingrained in the public um, imagination. Um, I think that it's really interesting to think, to think about the way that they have um, been artists of our reality. Um, so that's just a side note. <laughs> <laughs> but it's interesting. Thank you so much. Uh, I also want to highlight something Blake dropped in the in the chat that in the 19th century patent holders were seen as quite like close to artists um, and that the Smithsonian's American Art Museum is actually in the old patent office building and shows off some of the models uh, for inventions of that era, uh, which is kind of like a wonderful collision of all of these themes. Uh, I love what you're saying about world building. And if there is a link to your friend Keenan's uh, writing on civilization, if you wanna drop it in the chat, because I feel like that would be something we're also intrigued by. 
Um, I'd like to go now to a question by from Nick Bennett, which I will read uh, on his behalf. And that question is this, uh, it's for Asma and it's what is the best possible future of this project for you? Um, and my extension of that question, so it's really two questions, is uh, clearly this has been a year for sort of radical accountability. So with mutual aid, community funds, even just I think the way we're thinking of organizing is like human kindness on a larger scale. Uh, so I wanna add to Nick's question, what is the best possible future for this project for, to you and sort of invert it and ask uh, Asma, what do you need from us? So I think the best possible future for this project is just it existing as its own kind of space. I think that's the that's the one like really like big thing um, that I'm just kind of waiting for because I think once that space exists, there's so much that I can build onto um, for this project because I also, okay, if I have a space, maybe I do like book clubs for some teens or maybe they're actually hands-on like visual arts classes that happen like some weekends. Maybe I can allow this artist to come use the space to teach these students this, or there are just so many more things I can do when I have a space. So I think that's kind of like the best possible kind of outcome for it, just because I know from there, it's gonna grow out even more. Um, and I think, hmm. Oh, and there was a second part of your question. What was the second part of your question? What do you need from us? Oh, yes. Well, just continue to share this project. Just share the link to the Instagram account to let people kind of see what it is. That's really all I want is just so more people can just know about it. Just a little buzz in someone's ear because you never know. They're like, oh yeah, I heard about this thing. They might go to tell a friend about it never know who that friend might go and tell. So really tell a friend to tell a friend. That's, that's what I need um, from you guys and just continue to you know support the Instagram, engage with the page. Always feel free to ask me questions on there. Um, a lot of times people ask me like, where can I get this book? Most of the time, if I can find the book online, I'll tell you exactly where you can find it. I'll literally Google it right as soon as someone asks, like, okay, it's on eBay right now for $28. Um, so I'm always like a resource for people. So use me as a resource. That's also <laughs> what I'm asking. Okay. Um, I love that, that you're, you're building networks. Um, and I'm really excited to keep these networks uh, alive. Um, yeah, I'd like to turn this to Alexis Jasmine. Is there anything like what is my, my email? I will share that in the, um, oh, sure, in yeah. the chat, but my email is just asmawalton at gmail.com. So super simple. Um, but I will type it in here right now. Oh, perfect. All right. Um, and I'd love to like turn this question, sort of pass it along to you, Alexis and Jasmine. What what could you see as like the best possible future, the different possible futures in terms of world building, in terms of potential, um, in terms of just like imaginative potential for the Black Art Library and uh, what, what, would, what would it need? I mean, I feel like in the, go ahead, Jasmine. No, you please go ahead. My thoughts aren't fully formed yet anyway. <laughs> It's okay. I'm going to flow with them too. Um, yeah, no, I, I think that the Black Art Library can be a future space to have conversations like this, to continue to, you know, build people's thoughts and have the space for discussion and to continue to learn and have conversations about what they're learning, what they're reading, what they're taking away from the Black Art Library. I'm so excited to, you know, see a future where the Black Art Library is in Detroit that I can go visit and, you know, be a part of this space. Um, have access to maybe books and catalogs that I haven't seen before, um, you know, read there, learn there, meet people there who are interested in doing the same. Um, yeah, that's where I see it. And I'm so excited for that. Um, I'll definitely say that because reading was such a day-to-day -day part of my life, and it still is um, because of the work that I do, 
Um, I think that having access to a library like the Black Art Library is really going to have an impact on encouraging people to make reading a daily part of their lives. I think that with the amount of screen time that we have, um, like taking a step away to have a physical book in your hand, um, not to denounce like digital reading, I think that that's still really important, but I think that having these physical books will be really important um, for the visitors of the library. I also think that the fact that you founded the Black Art Library at such a unique and tumultuous point in history um, is really inspiring. And I also just hope that the Black Art Library shows people um, that these spaces are wanted. Um, like I mentioned earlier with like growing up in black um, owned bookstores, but then Amazon really like closing down so many bookstores, even Barnes and Noble was affected. Um, I think that it is really inspiring for me to see that um, these are still resources that people want um, and that people are seeking out. And I hope that other people feel the same way. I love that. Thank you so much. Um, I feel like I was asking a question to almost help myself imagine, like, now I'm so excited, like maybe after global pandemic, we can all go to Detroit, uh, which is obviously like a cultural heartland of the United States, but now we'll have one additional gem. I'm like imagining maybe this will be a place people do residencies, you know, artists will go spend time, uh, all kinds of like programming. I've, I have no idea what you have planned, but I'm so, so excited to follow along Asma. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, our last and closing remark before we go to the wonderful poet Charisma Price will come from our very own publisher, Fang Bui. Uh, and Fang, you should be able to turn on your mic now. Thank you, you guys. Thank you, Asma. Thank you, Alexis, Jasmine. I am working on the November editorial, but your conversation have distracted me greatly. <laughs> I, um, yes, it reminded me so much of the idea how the Tao Ho, you know, John Dewey talked about that a great deal and Habermas recreated in his own term um, public sphere. So idea is so interestingly because all three of you guys have this common share interest and what Blake was saying earlier uh, in the 30s, early on when MoMA and the Met were very accessible um, to, you know, viewer who potentially can be public educator, you know, but the idea it just reminded me that Eleanor Roosevelt who have significant influence on Franklin Roosevelt in terms of rebuilding the economy and everything else during the Great Depression through work progress administration, namely particularly federal project number one, which have everything, you know. But and then MoMA itself was also created by three women. Abby Aldrich Rockefeller being one, Lily Bliss and Mary Quinn Sullivan. Very, very interestingly, all happened at the same time, 1929, 1930 and whatnot. But the idea just now when you were articulating in the beginning is to get people there, seeing the real books, reading the text, seeing images. I mean, it's just so incredible because we tend to forget that great philosopher of aesthetics critic used to write about criticism through engravings, through early books, even black and white. Black and white reproduction have compelled so many great artists to be artists that we know. I remember talking to Chuck Close from Washington uh, state growing up in a small town, have access to black and white reproduction through the library or books that, that his mother took out for him. Same thing with Martin per year in Washington, DC. So these are, these are an important thing. I just want to reminisce a little bit when I was teaching graduate seminar, part of the reason why the rail have this strong tradition in reading poetry, because the three hour seminar dedicated the first hours about memorizing poem, each student had to uh, <laughs> read a poem by memory and I divided the, the class in half. One 
have is memorized from the screen of the computer or the iPhone. The other is from the book. And the first half never remember any. Why the second half who read from the book, memorized from the book, remember every single poem. So that's a very important distinction there, you know. But um, I want to make a, a quick point too uh, about the, the idea of however you can do it, you know. I don't think it's the time in which we have to think ahead. You know, this is not the time you analyze, you think ahead. It's a time of doing, you know, just like the Pack Horse Library Project, doing the, the WPA. I mean, they deliver book to remote region in Appalachian mountains, you know? And they did it more than a decade. You know, it was mostly mobilized by women, which is amazing. And the same thing not long ago in Occupy Wall Street, you remember that was what, 2011? The People Library. I donate at least 200 books there and spend many, many days there. And, um, you know, so that's one way of doing it. So I'm very pleased and incredibly proud that you guys think of it and, and to do it. You know, you think with your, your visceral sense of necessity not from the analytical mind, because that would never get, get anything done. So action is everything. So thank you so much. Thank you for being here with us and sharing your commitment, enthusiasm, and above all, passion, emotional content, which I've been telling everyone <laughs> in the team, counts a great deal. So thank you, Ashma. Thank you, Alexis. Thank you, Jasmine. Back to you, Malvika. Thank you so much, Fang. Uh, so we're now at Poetry Hour, um, and at the rail we have a tradition of ending lunch with a poem, which uh, we've been lucky enough to carry over into these Zoom events. So today I'm thrilled to welcome Kaveh Khadam Fellow and Poet Laureate of My Heart, Charisma Price, to this stage. Uh, before she reads for you, I'll tell you a little bit about her. Charisma Price is from New Orleans and holds an MFA in Poetry from New York University. Uh, her work has appeared in Poetry, Four Way Review, Wildness, The Adroit Journal, uh, and elsewhere. And she has received fellowships from Kaveh Khanum and New York University. She was winner of the 2019 Best of the Net Prize, a finalist for the 2019 Manchester Poetry Prize, and awarded the 2020 J. Howard and Barbara M. J. Wood Prize from the Poetry Foundation. When she's not collecting numerous accolades, she's also a visiting assistant professor of poetry at Tulane University down in New Orleans. Uh, give it up for the finest poet I know, Charisma Price. Hi, can you hear me now? Yes, sorry. Hi, I hope there's a uh... There are cars passing, so I hope that's not a distraction. But hi, uh, thank you so much for having me, um, Malvika. Nice, so nice to hear from Asma, Alexis, Jasmine, everyone from the Brooklyn Rail. It's really great to be here. Um, so I know I have about like six minutes, so I'll read maybe like three or four poems, if that's all right. Um, so like Malvika said, I'm from New Orleans, so most of my work is around New Orleans in the South. Um, so I have a uh, I've been told I have a really um, interesting resting face. So I have a series of poems called I'm Always So Serious, and this is one of them. They all sort of have the same title, but um, I'm always so serious, which is to say in the winters, I dream of owning a multi-floored mansion in New Orleans, specifically one on St. Charles Avenue with the wraparound porch and white pillars that would only see the likes of me if I were the maid, the midwife, the family mechanic, Archie Manning, the maintenance worker, or the mailman trusted enough to know the gate's nine digit pass code and leave the mail resting on the family's rain weathered mahogany rocking chair. In this particular dream, I'm the mailman. The marigold's red tongues lick the legs of the chair as I leave the mail on one of its non refurbished lead painted arms. Their green necks rapidly invade the eggshell painted porch like any poor soldier in need of his salt. I rip one from the ground for the sake of killing. Look it in its yellow center, a vibrant blister, before I rub it between my knuckles and render it a freshly ground thing. Looking back, 
This poem was only supposed to be about my sinuses, how even in my dreams, I sneeze at the sight of untended weeds, flowers whose mouths unfold under the brazen light of the sun. The nightmare is supposed to be about my allergies, how they only allow me to love what blooms from a distance. But in every dream, those vibrant marigolds are growing, keep, uh, keep growing. Their vines are needle thin tumors that keep stretching crazily onto the porch, keep making the rocking chair nervous at its own home. When I see that rocking chair, I see blood. It rocks like a heartbeat running from whatever is inside that mansion or behind it with a whip. And this next poem, um, since we're in hurricane season here, um, things that fold um, after the poet Jamal May, whose poem is Things That Break, um, things that fold. My father's voice after the cancer has spread, a flip phone, a flag, George Bush's hands as he pauses his vacation briefly for thoughts and prayers. My body next to the potted plant after my father throws the wooden chair, a cheaply made chair, a small stack of clothes, a birthday card, Milvertha Hendrix under the American flag five days after Hurricane Katrina. Her face from the crease made in her obituary photo as we used a newspaper to eat crawfish. The wrinkles in her forehead, flood water passing through a broken levee. My uncle's hands retaping the attic windows after the flood water rises. My cousin sleeping in the attic because no neighbor has a rescue boat. Black people in distress. We lay prostrate and call it prayer. The blankets on my cousin's shoulders days later when rescued. The National Guard's smile as he carries the neighbor's dog from the flood around his neck, an upside down flag. Um, I'm gonna read two more poems. Um, let me just flip to them. Um, so this, uh, this poem um, we're talking about, uh, one of the artists when I went to college, black artists that I learned was Romare Bairdin, and uh, luckily at our college, there was his, uh, the Odyssey, his um, sort of collage and like equating that to um, sort of showing black people's uh, traveling through transatlantic slave trade. Um, and at, at, I went to Columbia for undergrad and it, our core curriculum, we had to learn, we had to read Greek mythology. So this poem is called, um, it's, it's after reading the Odyssey, but also James Baldwin's If Bill Street Could Talk. I saw a lot of similarities in the characters, like you know, fathers being separated from their children, one due to war, one due to you know, racial bias and being imprisoned. And in this poem, I basically recast the, um, the character, I made the characters from James Baldwin, If Bill Street Could Talk, characters in the Odyssey. So. We wear each other's names. One, Fani recast as Odysseus in the epigraph from James Baldwin. He knows that he must do something to keep himself from drowning in this place, and every day he tries. Fani recast as Odysseus. I understand the liquor in us. We are away seizing each other's throats, stomaching all the bitters, and here you are, an audience making me a boy waiting to wife the eye of want again. Stop turning the pages. Don't reposition your antenna. Mold me out of the hollow that governs my joy to the mouth of rest. The water fights me over and over while Penelope bathes him in a tub of big water that babbles his name. I am every tongue my son learned to use in the lack of me. My son, come. Seek a ship that survives its trip home, call it mercy. Part two, um, the baby Alonzo Jr. recast as Telemachus, age 21. Um, and the epigraph from James Baldwin again. The baby asked, is there not one righteous among them? So Alonzo Jr. recast as Telemachus. Is there an ethics to myth making? Is there a family that imagination is not allowed to touch? Fani wanted to build Tish a table. To remain the center, my father tried to run me over. 
A wound is a bare patch of grass on which a baby's head falls, a plow that parts the earth like a rat tail comb. I hold my father's absence because it is the blade of my becoming. I twist my wrist so every vein is upright and exposed. Do you see me bleeding in the way only children can? In what way would you like to be devastated? I already know the color of my own tenderness. Yours is next to mine, tracing diamonds around the television. Breathing is a tender type of breaking. A myth is just someone bathing a boy in water, not yet made from weeping. Um, in this last section of the poem, um, Tish recast as Penelope, and the epigraph comes from um, the Odyssey. Um, she, um, it's from a piece of Penelope's dialogue. And now again, the storm winds have caught away my beloved son. Um, Tish recasts as Penelope. I say I live in a shushing, a woman waiting while a hero is out. Can you tell me it doesn't hurt to live here? Can you return to, for me, silence me out of witnessing myself? Unmistakably American, I stab the, uh, the onions. I wash a boy's hair in a warehouse fashioned into love. Sleep, I never do this. You are the toy civilian perched in the glass window, your bow and arm stuck flexing. I am the hand that paddles your parting. You are the shape without makes around the body. Moiety, moiety is an arrow campaigning for our now. All the world, the water, and just like the water, these throats want you dead. I say I live in a shushing, a hero out while. Can you tell me it doesn't hurt to live here? return to for me. Silence me out of witnessing myself, I stab, I never do this. Moiety and arrow campaigning for our now, all the world, the water, and just like the water, these throats want you dead. Um, and I'll read um, my last poem. Thank you again for having me here. So great to learn about visual art as someone who's not only a poet, as someone I, uh, really like filmmaking and photography. It was really great to hear uh, and be a part of this conversation. Um, so the last poem I have to thank my cell phone for, it's autocorrect. Um, so the title of the poem is called My Phone Autocorrects Nigga Tonight, like nighttime. And so I decided to write a poem about it. So my phone autocorrects nigga tonight. My nights play cousin to their mother's favorite kettles. My nights won't consume their reflection, so they pour milk in their coffee. My nights never rest, so they sing their shadows to sleep. Sometimes they don't remember any words. My nights have frogs stuck in their throats. No light soul, every bit of pain. My nights all Louis Armstrong minus a trumpet. And my nights play chicken with the train. My, my, my nights both shoe and polish, both Sambo and Bruce Leroy. We all little pretty medallions on our grandmother's nightstands. My nights are mistaken for other nights that bear no resemblance. I saw the sinew of the oldest knight in the neighborhood on the floor, his saint pendant missing. All the small, down-feathered nights scatter from the groan of pig sirens. My nights don't know their history. My nights are pecans without the trees that grow them. My nights instruct all the people in their head to weep. My nights hate the firefly cutting their darkness. My night, did you see them? They just walked right past us and didn't even speak. My nights are ordinary, wear ruffled socks, have the best belts. My nights don't always go to church, but my nights are lambs worthy of the morning. My nights are revised constitutions, crypt keepers. My nights are a congregation of alligators on a rumpus bayou. My nights hits, hiss into themselves, no one hears. Their blood rolls its eyes. My nights chew gum and sunflower seeds. My nights eat pork. My nights get the itis and slur their speech. My nights protest protests. The government watches. My nights live in Brazil, Botswana, the Congo, Cuba, DR, France, Grenada, Greece, Honduras, Ireland, Liberia, Lithuania, Nigeria, Venezuela, Zimbabwe. My nights live in America to remind you of me. Some people think my nights are better with their eyes closed, but my nights have beautiful corneas. My nights wash clothes that don't belong to them and won't look their bosses in the eye. My nights no necessity. My nights oblige. 
When my nights die, I wash them on my kitchen table. After my nights are washed, I throw away the table. My nights have names. My nights smell of sage. My nights smell of the muddy rivers they will never swim in again. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Charisma Price, everybody. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Charisma, thank you, Asma. Thank you, Alexis. Thank you, Jasmine. And thank you to everyone who is here with us in the audience today. Um, please join us again tomorrow when we will be joined by critic and author Blake Gopnik, who we met today um, in this conversation, who tomorrow will be in conversation with our very own editor, Amanda Glee-Busy. Uh, and they will be discussing his biography of Andy Warhol, which came out earlier this year and is really a fire publication. Uh, we'll conclude with a poetry reading from Sharon Mesmer tomorrow, and that will be, as always, at 1 p.m. right here in the Zoom. Uh, you can now turn on your microphones and say goodbye as you leave. Um, I'm dropping the link to Asma's fundraiser in the chat. Uh, we we got to make this happen. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, so thank you all so much. This has been incredible. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank 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 you. But I'm, I'm really hopeful and confident that this will be just like the first in a series of conversations, hopefully. So uh, we'll all be hearing from the Black Art Library. Like, no questions. <laughs> yes, we can help. Thank you guys so much.